thank you for this introduction, Alison. And my idea at the very beginning is to give you uh, an overview on the uh, presentations that we have and bring them into context of the observation equation first. So GNSS, as you very likely know, works in that way that we have some GNSS satellites emitting signals. We have ground stations with antennas that receive this signal. So we know uh, in, for an observation equation, both positions, and from this we can compute the direct geometric uh, distance between both. And this is the distance that we also expect to measure. But the, it's in fact a signal travel time with two independent clocks. So we need some clock corrections in addition and the signal has to pass through the atmosphere, which has a certain impact on the signal. And uh, in this way, we get a contribution from the lower and upper part, the troposphere and the ionosphere. So in fact, we have also a more accurate uh, phase measurement where we are measuring this distance in units of wavelengths of the carrier phase. And that's why we have here an additional term, which accounts for an unknown integer number of ambiguities at the beginning of the measurement. So this is quite a simplified observation equation. And at the end, we uh, want to go through now First of all, we should mention that most of the terms are time dependent, starting from the very quick satellites with four kilometers per second, down to a more relaxed velocity, thanks to the deformation of the earth, earth crust for the station positions and for all the terms, something in between. For many applications, you may assume that you can use the orbits from the IGS. And that's why the first presentation will come from the analysis center coordinator, Tom Herring, that introduces you to the available IGS products that you can use for several purposes. So if we go further to the station coordinates, then we see that we form in fact a vector difference. And from the mathematics, it is clear that both vectors have to join the same coordinate systems. But sometimes in the applications, we forget about this. And that's why it's an important point to remember that the orbits and the ground stations have to be consistent in the same reference frame. And what does it mean in particular for local and regional applications will be introduced by Sonia Costa on the example of the Sirgas South American network. Now uh, I have just put one vector for the station positions, but in fact, uh, the measurement ends at a more complex surface, which is the electronic phase center of the antenna. And we need then some corrections depending from the direction where the signal is coming from. And uh, this is then a question of antenna calibrations, which is valid for receiver and satellite antennas. For the satellite antennas, we get the additional issue that uh, the antenna is not mounted at the center of mass of satellite, but at the surface of the satellite body. And so we get an additional vector for this correction. Arturo Filiger, as the chair of the antenna calibration working group, will discuss this topic in his presentation. 
So we have the clock turns. And to be honest, I have cheated here as well a bit in the observation equation because identical for the different observation types is only the reading of the hardware clock in the receiver and satellite. We have, in addition, some cable delays and signal processing effects that uh, end up in some hardware delay biases that depend on the signal frequency, signal type, and even on the GNSS. And they are different for code and phase. On top, we want to resolve for the uh, ambiguities, meaning that we come back to the integer nature of the ambiguity term here. For this, we have three presentations or three contributions from Mike Kuhlmann, Urs Huckentoppler on the clock parameters and from Stefan Scheer on the bias and the ambiguity resolution. So last but not least, we have then also the atmosphere. First, the upper part, the ionosphere. Here we are lucky, the microwave signals from the GNSS are this perceived here. So it means the effect is frequency depending if we have dual frequency signals, we can cancel this effect out by adding some corrections. So from this, we assume for tonight that we don't need further effort for the ionosphere, but for the troposphere, we need a proper modeling. And this will be the last presentation of tonight given by Johannes Böhm. Now, uh, what does it mean such a, a set of measurements? We have possibly not just one receiver, but several receivers, and we have settle, several satellites involved. At the end, we want to have a network solution of uh, several receivers, considering all the satellites. If we don't have a global network, then we introduce possibly the orbits from the IGS in our solution, but the uh, observations from the different receivers can still talk to each other via the satellite clocks. But if you also fix the satellite clocks from IGS products, then the individual data from the different receivers cannot talk to each other anymore. And so we get then separations for uh, separated solutions for each receiver and not a network solution anymore. Meaning for a real network solution, we have to solve for all clock parameters. So looking at the corresponding equations. So in the first line I have the first station, the second line, the second station on the left-hand side, one satellite on the right-hand side, another satellite. And this can be then easily extended to N stations and satellites. But for what I want to show now, this is enough because when we want to have the network solutions, we have to solve for the clocks. And if you make an estimate, then you get a huge number of clock parameters for each receiver and satellite at each epoch one parameter. If you are not in particular interested in the clocks, then uh, it may make sense to reduce this huge number of parameters from the system. This can be done just by differencing the measurements from two stations to one and the same satellite. This I have written here down and you can see we have the same satellite correction, satellite clock correction uh, with different signs. So this cancels out. And now I do another simplification so that the equation doesn't become that long. I just take indices for this differences here so then this Ti minus Tj is now Tij. And now we see already this term here for the receiver clock is the same for both. And then 
I end up with double difference observations. Um, if I compare this double difference observation equation with the original ones, the geometric term are still the same for the troposphere, for the positions of satellites and stations. So from this, nothing has changed there when uh, forming these differences. And another fact is that now the ambiguity is the only linear term that I have in the observation equation. And in the original ones, I have then also the clock parameters as linear terms. So mathematically, I have done nothing else than setting up a huge normal equation and preliminating the clock parameters. And the solution for all parameters is really equivalent independent on which difference level I'm working if I consider all the correlations that appear due to this difference. Ambiguity resolution is simpler on the double difference level because then I have a direct access to the integer ambiguity. Otherwise I need some biases uh, to consider this, but there Stefan will tell more about this. So um, there is uh, the common saying around when forming differences, some effects are canceled out that are common to both stations at a baseline or in a network solution. This is true, but the consistency in the zero difference approach is again recovered because the satellite clock parameters can absorb this common pattern in all the station, uh, station signals. So this I can illustrate here in the sketch if we have a global network and the satellite has a certain nadi angle, then there's an angle of only 14 degree I can observe as a satellite the entire radius of the Earth. The cosine of 14 degree is still uh, 0 0.97, so it's very close to one, meaning I get a big correlation between the satellite clock and all common mode that is in the signal of the stations that are observed at the same time from one and the same satellite. In a global solution, I'm lucky the distribution of the observation is in a way that most of the observations are closer to the 14 degree nadir angle. But if I have only a local original network, then the situation becomes more dramatic because for a satellite, a small country like Switzerland is just a dot. And then all the signals go into the same direction. And if I have then a common mode error in all these uh, signals, then this can be easily absorbed by the satellite clock. So last but not least, I want to introduce also the precise point positioning, not only the network solution, because it's a very popular tool to process GNSS measurements. And let's assume that we have uh, 1,200 stations. 1,000 of them are sitting in a small area like Switzerland, and then 200 are distributed around the world. So first of all, I have to process uh, the global solution to obtain orbits, satellite clock corrections, earth rotation parameters, but for this, I don't need 1,000 stations in that small area. For this purpose, it's enough to choose just one to cover also this area. And then I can first take the 200 station, make a global solution and introduce in principle, this 1,000 stations with a zero weight into the processing. And in this way, I can do a global solution. I introduce a datum definition for the stations 
around the globe obtain consistent orbits and satellite clock corrections. And this solution I can take from the satellite orbit satellite clock corrections. And now I can benefit from the fact that uh, the observations are now independent for each of this 1000 stations. I can take 1000 CPUs and I have done a solution in a parallel mode, very, very quick and efficient. This is the way how PPP is working. And at the end, I get a consistent solution for this 1200 stations on ground together with the global parameters that I have also solved for. When we look in the observation equation, then we see the same phenomena. We have a set of stations forming a global network and a huge number of additional sites. And they we first introduced with a zero weight. Then we compute from the global solution, the satellite orbit, satellite clock corrections. They are introduced in the next step for this huge number of stations as known. And then we obtain the uh, solution for the station dependent parameters. So if you see it as a system of equations, nobody would get the idea to use another modeling for this uh, last part of observations than for the others. So it means, in fact, even if precise point position stands for point positioning, we should have in mind that we join a global network solution where our stations uh, are introduced with a zero weight. And if you look at this with this eyes, then it is really obvious that the modeling for the PPP has to be the same as for the global solution. Then it's not the question whether you may have a better modeling. No, you have to be just consistent. And each inconsistency will degrade your PP results to a more or less big extent. The other point is the datum definition for the station coordinates from PPP you got just from the global solution. You don't need to do a separate datum definition here, which may have uh, advantages if you have a isolated network somewhere. Okay, with this introductory remark, I want to hand over to uh, the next speaker. I hope that you enjoy the evening. Tom Herring here, start my share. Are there questions somewhere? So I haven't seen any questions in the chat, but if at any point anyone has questions, please write them on the chat. And right now, if there's any question pending, please, we still have some time before we transition. Okay. If not, we can continue. Yeah. Thomas. Please, um, okay. I stop sharing and now you can take over.